perspective of Israel and why it's so important to uh, support Israel, to advocate for Israel, and to just uh, be the people we are, the people of the book, and promote amongst the churches the need to pray for Israel. So, Keith, you're first on you, I think. Have you got, can you bring the uh, mic? Thank you. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Um, I really enjoy these runs. This is the fourth one, the fourth run that we've done now. And uh, it's quite exciting, really, because when you do the run or the walk, you bump into people and they say, what are you doing? You know? And I was walking with Hugh last year, you know Hugh? And um, somebody came uh, nearby and said, uh, what's going on? What are you doing? And we, we both said, well, we're running for Israel. And saying, why? You know, why? So we tried to explain to, to this guy. And I think he was, he was a Buddhist. He was a, he was a scouser for a start. So that disappointed me because I'm a scouser. <laughs> um, but anyway, he said he was a Buddhist. Anyway, we said, can we pray for you? So we prayed for this man on, on the walk, which was quite interesting. And he thanked us. And it, it was a really nice time. Anyway, but it's about showing our love and support for Israel, isn't it? So I've only been to Israel once, but I hope to go more. I'm going this year anyway with our tour. Um, but it's an exciting time naturally and spiritually because we see God's land, don't we? And we see where Yeshua walked, learning the history and the spiritual experience that it is. As you know, it's God's land. Yeah? And somehow it calls you back. A land promised to Abraham... And that was a huge area of land, wasn't it, originally? So if you look into the history, you'll see how big it was. It's a huge triangle, actually. A huge area of land, not the sliver of land that we see today. And that is due to the theft of the nations that have sorry, conspired against Israel. Amen. You know that. It was a land given to God's covenant people. A people that fell from their spiritual status and purpose. But God had promised them a kingdom reigning over the Gentiles. A nation reborn in 1948. A miracle. Isaiah 66 verses 8 to 10 says, Who has ever heard of such things? Who has ever seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. Do I bring to the moment of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Do I close up the womb when, when I bring delivery, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her. Today, Israel stands as a great innovative nation. We see this all the time. We see this in the news, the news that we're allowed to see about Israel because much of it is censored. It's incredible discoveries in medicine, not least in cancer uh, treatments. Mike talked about this in his podcast yesterday. So he shows us that God is our healer. How wonderful. Major progression in technology, engineering, and now even space technology. How clever are they? Wow. It's a country that seeks peace with all nations. When there are disasters in the world, who is always the first to offer help? Israel. <laughs> they always respond with aid, know-how, practical help. But they're sometimes rejected by nations who despise Israel. Israel is treated with disrespect, fueled by anti-Semitism. Constantly condemned by the UN. Rocket fire and building of tunnels from Gaza and Lebanon. This is to seize innocent women, men, women and children. To slaughter them. I've taken captive. The BDS movement. 
They even, it even includes the harassment of performers wishing to work in Israel. So has God given up on Israel? We ask the question, no. Has he given up on the children of Israel, his covenant people? God sees them as the apple of his eye. Over 90% of the Bible speaks of God's prophetic purpose for Israel as a nation and as a people, right? Isaiah 62, verse 7, this, this scripture says, He establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. He also shows us in scripture, throughout scripture, many ways where he teaches us his ways. His Torah teaching. We learn the way to walk in him. In obedience, rejecting sin, and staying clean. During the time of Paul's ministry, Messiah had come to show himself a savior, but the Jews began to doubt God's promises. Some had even thought that God had, had, had uh, cast them away forever. Sorry, I think I missed a page. Romans 11, verse 1. This is Paul speaking. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Paul dispels this in Romans 9, 10, and 11. In Romans 9, 6, it is not though God's word had failed. So perhaps they thought like the theologians today, that God has replaced Israel with the Gentile church. This is true. We come up with this all the time. And the covenant being made only temporal, not everlasting. Because the covenants were actually everlasting covenants, weren't they? Paul says in Romans 11, verses 25 and 26, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. We studied the book of Malachi recently in our home group. Um, how he sees God, this is Malachi speaking of God, he sees him in three functions, just as the Tanakh does. Now, where the churches who are so steeped in replacement theology teach from the New Testament seemingly only that God is our loving Father, which he certainly is, they fail to see three, the three, these three dimensions of God in the Tanakh and the Old Testament. He is creator in our past, king in our present, and judge of our future. And Malachi speaks of refining first before restoration. As we're approaching the end of the age, how do we recognize the sign of the times? Today, Adonai is calling his people out of the nations. They are to make Aliyah, to go up, to fulfill scripture. And he wants them in the land ready for Messiah. He wants them in there. It's 2,000 years since the last prophecies regarding Israel. Today is what they call the church age or the times of the Gentiles. But this is coming to an end. And this is so important for Christendom to understand that, that this time, these times are coming to an end and they, they need to be ready because Yeshua will return. 
Jeremiah 30, verse 3. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. And Jeremiah 23, verse 3. There's lots of scriptures about Aliyah, by the way. Jeremiah 23, verse 3. And I will get, gather the remnants of my flock out of all countries where I, I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. What a fantastic promise, people of Israel. For the Lord also commands the nations not to hold on to them, to not stop the Jews making Aliyah. In Isaiah 43, Verses 5 and 6, he says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. And I will say to the north, Give them up. And to the south, Do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. They're amazing scriptures, aren't they? That we are so familiar with here. But sometimes we despair at how a lot of people don't see this, don't see it at all. But God is calling the people back to the land. Ezekiel 36 says the Jews will be taught by the Jews who have already been saved. Jeremiah 31 Verses 7 and 8. According to Zechariah, the Jews will repent when they see Yeshua stand on the Mount of Olives. And they will be cleansed and born again. And this happens because all will be in the land. All the Jews will be in the land. How that works, I do not know. How they fit, who knows. But God gathers his people back to the land to show that he is God. Amen. But he's bringing also those from the other sheep pen, the Gentiles, us. John 10 verse 16 says, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them back also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So he's gra grafting us Gentiles into the vine, the spiritual root, root which is Yeshua. John 15 verse 1 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Amen. Today, uh, there are many Jewish believers in Yeshua, which is wonderful. And they join us, Gentiles, as one new man. We are blessed to be together. But Israel will see in the future when Yeshua returns, and the scales will drop from their eyes, and they will be grafted into the vine. Romans 11, verse 26 says... And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. So we see salvation is of the Jews. Much to the, ang to the anger of many people in Christendom. Gentile salvation. That's a glorious manifestation of the grace of God. The fullness of times will be greater still. Romans 11, verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness We must pray for Israel continuously. 
We must continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we do. We need to step up our prayers, don't we? Jerusalem is a city of incredible significance. Did you know that in Israel's turbulent history, Jerusalem has been destroyed twice, under siege 23 times, attacked 52 times, and captured and recaptured 44 times. What an incredible history they have. But there will be peace one day when Yeshua returns as king. Amen. And from that day when Yeshua returns, it will be established in peace and righteousness. For how long? A thousand years, millennium reign. Jeremiah 3.17 tells us that Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord. And all the nations will be gathered unto it. All the nations. To the name of the Lord. So just to finish, God will always have his people Israel. And Israel will always have title to their land. Amen. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, we've, all people are deeply and richly blessed here because we are united with Israel. Amen. And that's a glory. That is a glory, and it's a process. And for each of us, it's happened differently. We've all come in differing ways. Um, and we're still not in the right place yet, and we won't be until he returns. Amen? But the journey is a wonder, and it's a beautiful thing. And you know what's special? This living book. This living book. For 10 years once, every day, I read, I read through the Bible in a year, every day for 10 years. And it was an absolute foundation for me. <laughs> Psalm 102.13 You will arise and have mercy on Zion. For the time to favor her, yes, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. And then verse 18, this is written for the final, in Hebrew, acharit, the final generation yet to come, a people yet to be created. Praise Adonai. Now that's a wonder because we are a people called. But you know my heart weeps for the church. And my heart has wept for the church ever since the very first time I realized and recognized how crucial Israel was. In the first year of our salvation, 35 years ago, we were taken to, a few have heard this, but I will share it. We were taken to a fellowship in um, Liverpool to hear a Messianic Jew give his testimony and explain how he found the Lord, etc., etc. And I said, Ed, this is the missing piece. It's Israel. Now, that was in our first year of faith. And we were in a church that had no understanding whatsoever. And as Keith said, read from the New Testament, never the Hebrew Scriptures. And we knew that we were called. We were called. And that was a beautiful thing. And we have never looked back. We've followed that path ever since, building on building, removing this, taking away this, encouraging one here and another there. And many refused and many still refuse today, don't they? It's a very hard thing because the enemy 
has really gone against Israel in a massive way through the church. And it's a terrible thing because there's some beauty in the church as well. It's very tragic. I was very good, Mike. I didn't write things down. Not like some we could mention. <laughs> Romans 15, for all scripture is, was the very foundation that brought us to our faith. All scripture is God-breathed. I love that phrase. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Because he, the Lord has his heart for our heart. He wants all of us. He doesn't want our words. He doesn't want our religion. He doesn't want our behavior. He wants our heart. And that's why we were so blessed when Yeshua left this earth. He said, unless I go, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh cannot come. So the Holy Spirit has come and he's alongside us. He's with us whenever we care to hear, ask questions, gain understanding. He's there to inform us and direct our path and our walk. And where else would we be but to be here alongside? I love this. Psalm 110, verse 34. Forgive me because I have to use my glasses some of the time, but keep praying for my eyes, guys. God will heal them. Amen? Amen. And there we read a wonderful prophet, David. And he says, The Lord of the Lord, your people, your people shall be willing in the day of your power, in the beauty of holiness, such a phrase, in the beauty of holiness. From the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. For you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, it's all about us being called out to be with the Lord and to do his work as and where we can, literally, as and where we can. Yes, we've been to Israel many, many times. I think this is our 28th time. And each occasion, there's been one little moment when we've been able to share with some people. And it takes courage. It takes a boldness that isn't of yourself. Lord, you have to pray each time. Open my mouth, open my heart. Help them to see truth. And there was one occasion I went, remember we went to um, dinner with one couple, a Jewish couple from America, and he was a very well-off uh, architect and a big business in America. And they came to Israel for a little holiday. And he was totally impacted. Bear in mind, these guys had never met us before, but they opened their hearts. And they were deeply impacted with the land of Israel, the people of Israel. And yet they're Americans. Went home couldn't settle. It was impossible to settle. They knew they had to sell their business and come to live in Israel. We were so, you know, so touched, really impressed by that. And he said, but you know, he said, the boat's gone. I said, you were on it. You guys were on it and the boat's gone. I said, yes, but guess what? It's coming back. So it's little incidents like that that really help us to, um, to touch lives somehow. But more, ho more closely to home, how are you impacting your church friends? Is there some way you've got a contact with somebody that you're bringing on? And you know what the best thing is to do is take them to the Hebrew Scriptures and ask a question. You know, you're surely by now, surely we're equipped enough to go and speak with our friends and family. When it comes to family, I have a massive problem because my daughter-in-law is totally against anything to do. I couldn't even use the word Yeshua. It's impossible. But you know, 
there's something in my younger son. There's something in my younger son that I believe the Lord has a heart to bring him to faith. And so I'm believing for that. Next, next Shabbat, I'll have my older son here, which is a beautiful thing. Um, because he's the person, when he was 17, through whom I came to faith. I saw his life absolutely change. He was hard, bitter, saddened, and yet he found the Lord. And I saw, wow, what a difference. And it was through him, through his church. I said, Ed, we have to find a church like that. And so we did, up in Wallasey. And that's where we came to faith. But it's all a journey, isn't it? Now, each of us is called differently. I'm very much called to the Word. I know many of you are. But it, I live in the Word. And I particularly love, as you know, I love the prophets. They have so much to say to us. So much to say. I'm looking at Ezra at the moment, and that was a, a turning point in the experience of the Jews. So I just felt it was right to share, rather than a lot of scriptures, because we've had that beautifully from Keith, just to share a little bit of personal journey and um, the passion that has not changed, has not lessened, it's deepened. Seek the Lord and his word. Amen. Great. Well, it's the eyes of the heart that personal. matter. It's Sorry. the eyes of the heart that matter, the not the eye. Heart. It is. And you've got a real heart for Israel, haven't you? And I know our Dutch friends have got a real heart for Israel, haven't you? And you've just had a conference, the Jer Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast in The Hague, haven't you? And was it good? Was it? Great. And you had some people from America teaching about Israel, didn't you? And so that's great. And we're with friend, you're with friends here because... Uh, we have a passion for Israel here, and, uh, and Wales always has had a passion for Israel, but it's because of God's prophetic voice that he's put, not just in the scripture, but put in our hearts as well, and like Jill and Keith, and all, most of us here, and, and uh, big Keith here, uh, passionate about Israel, as we all are, and um, we, we try our best to look at Israel as a fulfillment of God's promises, his prophetic word, and that's what we do. And, and one of the words that uh, God has given me for today is if you get your Bibles, if you've got them, um, in Isaiah 35 it says uh, that the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. And, and, and God is speaking through Isaiah about Israel because Isaiah is the prophet who comforts Israel and he speaks just about Israel. And Isaiah says, the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing and the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it and the majesty of Carmel and Sharon and they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. That is just one of thousands of scriptures in here. How many prophetic scriptures did you say, Keith, in the Bible? 90% you said. So that's just one of the 90% of prophetic words that are in the, in the scriptures here about Israel, just about Israel. And, and, and we can see in our time, in our generation, those prophetic words becoming true, being fulfilled. And it's exciting. A hundred years ago, the guys didn't our guys didn't, uh, didn't know whether God was going to fulfill those scriptures. They just had faith that God was going to fulfill them. And, and we today have faith that God is going to fulfill the scriptures that are spoken of about the future, scriptures such as, the, as these in Isaiah. Now, Israel was uh, given independence in 1948. And since then, it's grown immensely. It's, there's now 8 million people living there. There were 600,000 in 1948. And Israel now is, is in, the, in the top 20 of the UN index of, um, and I'll just get this right, human development, that, which means that actually they're in the top 20 nations of the world that are at such a high level of development that they can have an effect on other nations. 
And Israel does have an effect on other nations in so many areas. Keith touched on it with, with medical advancement, military advancement, and other advancements. But I, I can tell you that Israel itself, just for its own purposes, produces 95% of all it needs. So it only has to import 5%. Now, that's far better than us. And, and, and it's, it's massive, actually. That figure is huge. And... and um, it produces its own fruit and vegetables, citrus, flowers, and, and in fact exports tulips. <laughs> and I learned from Lenora that actually you buy your tulips from South Africa, I think. And they come pretty well frozen. And you turn them into lovely packages which you sell to us at a vast profit. <laughs> But you know what we're going to do? We're going to buy flowers directly from Israel in the future. And we're going to cut you out. <laughs> no, seriously. Israel produces abundance of flowers and, and sells them. And, and usually sells them in the winter when flowers are hard to get from other places. I mean, they're, they're so dynamically visionary because God has put that inside them. It's like a massive. In 1973, when the Yom Kippur War was on, two Israeli scientists produced... Sweet tomatoes, tiny little tomatoes that you now sell, <laughs> and you now grow in your vast greenhouses in Holland and say that they're Dutch, but actually the science of it, is, <laughs> the science of it is Israeli. They're amazing, absolutely amazing. And um, they've become a, a, a global player in all sorts of uh, agriculture. They produce soil conditioners in such a way that they can actually create a growing desert. They can put, they've made the desert bloom, literally. If you go down to the south of Israel, we're going to go when we go on our trip in uh, September, when we do our tour to Israel, we go down to the south to Starot, and we're going to see Nomi, by the way. And she sends her love to everybody. And, uh, and, and we, we go down to the Gaza area, and there in the desert, we see the grow growing of all sorts of fruits, citrus, uh, pomelas, uh, avocado, kiwi, all those things are grown down there in the desert. You know, in, in 2000, sorry, in 1917, when the Welsh army were in the Gaza area fighting with the Turks, they made a comment to say, this place is so mosquito infested that actually, why are we fighting for it? And then their clergyman gave them pamphlets to say, we're not fighting for the land of Israel, the, the mosquitoes and the swamps that are around Gaza. This is what the clergy said in their pamphlets, was we're fighting in honor of the God of Israel who has promised this land as a fulfillment to the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that was Welsh battalions. 297 Welshmen died in that battle with the Turks. And they died because of the honor of God's word. And, 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 and that is just lovely, isn't it? And, 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 and I know that since then, the Dutch have grown in love for Israel. And in fact, if you look at European support for Israel, the Dutch people have more support than any other nation for Israel. And you have Christian Friends of Israel, which is a massive organization in Holland, isn't it? I, I think it's still big, isn't it, Bernard? It, it's massive, isn't it? So it's a huge thing. In, in the Galilee today, they are breeding fish, trout, carp, salmon in the Galilee Lake. And, and it's huge. They're using parts of the Jordan to produce fish. And, and for you, Ed, I, I think you know anyway. Little Ed behind you, big Ed. <laughs> Ed the milkman. <laughs> Israel, Israel's cattle per capita, produce more milk than any other nation in the world. That's more milk per cow than America, Australia, New Zealand. And it's the New Zealanders profess to be the big dairy people, don't they? But they're not. It's Israel. And, and they, per cow. Now, that is in a place where there's little grass. It's the blessing of God. 
absolute blessing of God. Now, we think that we are the first uh, congregations throughout Europe who've supported Israel, don't we? We, we think that, don't we? But, but throughout history, there have been congregations throughout Europe, in Holland, in France, in, in Germany, every nation, and in, certainly in the UK, congregations throughout history have supported Israel. Now, Isaiah 40 says, comfort, comfort my people. I think that's a lovely scripture, do you? I think you use that. You've got a, 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 um, uh, an organized charity in Holland, which is called Ami. Ami. Um, it's comfort, comfort my people in English. But what, does it, what is it in Holland? Do you speak Dutch? No. no yeah. <laughs> she... She was only born there and only came over here 12 months ago, but she doesn't speak. To <laughs> she only speaks English. It's called Ami something. Ami, Ami. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But they, that ministry in Holland is, is a ministry which sends aid to Israel. And um, it's a lovely ministry. And, but there's, we've always had within the congregations a, a people with a heart for Israel. Who, who want to fulfill that scripture of comforting Israel in whatever way they can, whether it's prayer, whether it's practically, whether it's in advocacy, which is what we're doing tomorrow. Whatever way, there's always been congregations and people throughout Europe and the world who've supported Israel. And I want to talk about a guy called Vavasa Powell, who in 1641 in the UK, in Wales, he was born in Radnorshire, which is part of Wales, he was a, a, a passionate believer in Yeshua. And he was what we call a fifth millennialist. And a fifth millennialist is somebody who is a Christian who believes that Yeshua is going to come back and reign for a thousand years. What's wrong with that? Is that going to happen? Yeah, that's what we believe, isn't it? But as Keith alluded to, and Jill, some people don't believe that. But Professor Powell did in exactly the same way as we did. And in 1641, he was locked up, imprisoned, and he, he served a short time in prison and then was released. And then in 1660, Vavasa Powell uh, was arrested again because King Charles didn't like the idea of a spiritual king being having more authority than him. And that was King Charles II. And, and uh, people who were like us and like Vavasa Powell were arrested and imprisoned. And Vavasa Powell served a prison sentence from 1660 to 1667 because of that belief. He came out of prison and he preached again that Yeshua was going to come back and reign for a thousand years. And he got imprisoned again and actually died in prison three years later. So this man was one of many in Wales who were passionate about Israel. And I want to tell you something about, a little bit about his wife, because his wife was called Catherine. And she was a passionate fifth monarchist, like we are. Absolutely passionate. And, and, and you know... She rem when I found this bit of a, um, uh, archive information, which I found in a textbook in Bangor University archives, digging through the archives, reading through the archives, it reminded me of you, Jill. It reminded me of you because Jill is so passionate about Israel. And, and Jill's passion is that we pray for Israel. Now, I know um, you won't be having the prayer for Israel until October again, but Jill usually has prayer for Israel on the first Wednesday of every month throughout the year, except we're in Israel when we have the next one. And then, well, the next one we're off. We're at August holidays. But Jill is passionate about prayer for Israel. And if you can get along to the prayer for Israel meeting on the first Wednesday of every month, other than <laughs> the next two months, Get along there because, because Jill is just one of a continuation of people that God has put on this earth to inspire prayer for Israel. And, Ka and, and Catherine Powell, whose husband was in prison for all those years and was a passionate believer, said this about Israel. And it's confirmation that actually we've had people here in Wales for all these years who have prayed for Israel. And this was in 16, um, 
between 1660 and 1667, she wrote this piece and she said, a man in much prayer should set aside one part of the day alone to seek God for Sion. Now, they used to call it Sion then, S-I-O-N, but it's actually Zion. To seek God for Zion, not mixing other requests at that time. She was so passionate that she said that we should pray for Israel at one time in the day and for nothing else. Isn't that amazing? And her husband's in prison because he supported Israel. A Welshman supporting Israel. Now, in Holland, like in the UK, Sabbath keepers and fifth millennialists, who are the same, have been slaughtered throughout Holland. But in the 17th century, your Sabbath keepers and fifth millennialists actually helped us because we were facing mass persecution under something called the Conventicles Act and the Five Mile Act. I know that won't mean anything to you, but, but they were acts of parliament that were created by the king and the church to prevent people speaking about Sabbath and speaking about Israel. And the Dutch, even though you were facing persecution and the countries around you like France and, and um, uh, Germany and other countries in Europe were facing persecution, you welcomed the Welsh and the English who were under that persecution and fled to save their lives in many cases. You welcomed them in Holland and you sustained them and you fed them and you gave them homes and hospitality. And then those Puritans, as they were then, left Holland with your support and went to live in Rhode Island in America where they continued to practice the faith in the way that we practice today. And we practice our faith because we're free to do so. And you today in Holland are free to keep Sabbath and support Israel. But there may one, may one day come a time when we will face the same persecution as people faced in the 16th and 17th century. It's now in political terms, uh, uh, seen, support for Israel is seen as being something which is far-right fascist in thought and ideas. And uh, support for Israel is now being seen as a, as a matter of uh, bigotry in political terms. And one day we may face persecution. So we may come and live with you, Vernon. <laughs> or you may come and live with us. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen in the future? But there's one thing certain. God has promised the Jewish people. He will gather them back to the land of Israel. And there he will establish them. And there he will make Israel bloom and blossom. And the world will see that there's a God in heaven who is the God of Israel. Who has come to save the nations through the nation that was birthed through Abraham all those years ago, and we are part of that. What an amazing, amazing gift God has given us to be a part of something so spiritual, so visionary, so prophetic that I am surprised that throughout Europe and, the net, and certainly throughout the UK, there are so few of us. So what I want to do, I want us to pray for Israel. I want us to stand and pray. And Margaret, can you play? I want us to stand for Israel. And I want us to pray collectively at the same time for Israel. But I want us to pray, as Jill had said earlier on about the church, actually getting the vision for believers to get the vision to support this nation of Israel and be proud to be fifth millennials. Can we do that? And see if God will answer prayers to bring people, more people into the congregation in The Hague, in Dordrecht, in, in the Netherlands, in Germany where we've been, in, and, and here in the UK, for people 
to change their hearts and their minds to Israel and be a blessing to Israel so that our nations can be blessed. Shall we stand? Margaret, can you play? Just, just shout out to God whatever you want to shout.